Now, some of you, you may think, I don't have the gift of prophecy. I'm not in the office of prophet. But nevertheless, this is the month where the prophetic revelation must be processed out regardless of what is your gift. And then next month, we're going into the, uh, the month where we celebrate Pentecost, receiving the word, Torah, and the Spirit of God. So with, with this backdrop, I want to start a new series, Building the House of the Lord in the Seven Mountain. Because last year, remember, we did a whole long series, right? Talking about foundation, talking about how this is the year God wants His house to be built. Now, by the way, the house of God is different for all of us. You will build a particular building and then we all come together. There is a corporate expression. But it's very important. We have to go into the, the marketplace. We have to go into whatever the law has asked us to go. This is the era of decentralization. We cannot come and hope to do things within the four walls of the church. This is great, but this is not the aim. The aim is to be trained to go out and you're going to do great damage wherever you are out there. So, building the house of God, Seven Mountain, this is going to be something that is going to be very personalized to each one of you. We all have passion. Some of you are very passionate about arts and entertainment. Some of you are very passionate about education. Some of you, government, etc., etc. And it doesn't matter. Don't allow the idea of other people to define who you are in this season. Very important that we, we discover who we are. That there is that process. So remember, we talked about from head of the year, October last year until Passover, we've been doing the foundational teaching, building the house of the Lord for the future. I think six or seven, I can't remember how many teachings. It's all on YouTube if you, you kind of miss some of those or you want a bit of refresher. And we talk about five things in each of the teaching. There is always the foundation. Every project has a foundation. I mean, some of us here are in construction industry. They will tell you, without the foundation, you can't build anything. And even when you want to do a business, sometimes you need a company. And the company needs a certain capital. It needs a certain payout. It needs a certain licensing, qualification, shareholder requirement, etc., etc. So the foundation is what we call the core, the non-negotiable aspect of building project. Now, at this point, I should say that since we are in the kingdom of God, our foundation has to be on kingdom. Our foundation has to be on the biblical truth. So often, and, and yesterday I was just, you, you know what is a rage now, right, in, in the media? It, it's all about the, the abortion law in, in US, right? And I was just reading a profile of a politician who 10 years ago started off coming into politics as a pro-life person. And in 10 years, he was a believer. He is still a believer, I believe. But he has totally shifted into pro-abortion. So it's... Really, when you move away from the biblical foundation, things start to come, start to crumble. The material, are we bringing in our best sacrifice and resources? So just now, you know, somebody was sharing, you know, the, the Passover, I know it was late, our announcement, okay? It was really, really late because we are really not sure what the Sarawak government is going to do. And we don't want people to get stuck at airport and have to come back. Etc. Et so we, we did announce, but I'm glad so many of you still make the choice to go. Sacrifices are made, time, financially, etc. etc. So, so we know that people are sacrificing and God knows that you are sacrificing. So that's why regardless of what material you use, He will pay back. He will replace it with even higher level of material, okay? Workmanship, and, and this is something that is going to be very crucial in our understanding of the Seven Mountain because we're talking about the quality of our expression. It's going to be very different for, for each one. And this is a season, I believe, the Lord wants to improve our workmanship. Personal touch. What is your unique calling? What is your unique gift? And, and later, I'll just talk a little bit about how we go about uh, talking about our spiritual and natural gift. So, so I'm glad just now, you know, you remember Joshua was giving his testimony, right? It's spiritual and it's natural. You don't just use a spiritual solution. You don't just use a natural solution. We have both. Why not use both? And this is a season we are causing many people to be commissioned, to be sent out. And there is a process. There is a process of discovering who we are and be really, really comfortable. Now, I, I want to say this at this point, that it is, we can get very excited about commissioning, but that is not the point. 
The point is to do what we're supposed to do in the kingdom of God. So it's like people can get caught up with commissioning. I want more and more. It's just like we can get caught up with receiving prophecy. Remember the, the early days, people are collecting prophecy. And so, so we, we have to look at the final picture. I'm going to talk about that a little while. Then robustness, this is a new word we learned last year, right? Would it stand the test of time? Because God puts a test to the house. It will be tested with fire. It will be tested with natural disaster. And then we will see how tough it is. So, so now we, we cross into 5782. We pass over with the month of Nisan. Now it's the month of Iyah. It is time for us to develop this house within the, the sphere, within whatever area that the Lord has led us. Now, very quickly, I talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago, but just a quick refresher. Whenever we talk about Seven Mountains, you know, don't get too anxious, don't get too spooky about that because it's simply a template. It's simply a strategy. It's not a theology. It's not a dominion theology. It just causes us to understand what are the culture modes? That's why in this month of Iya, I want to encourage everyone. If you are not the type that read news, you really have to start reading. And you really have to start finding the right source of news because there are so many fake news out there. And the Lord is causing His people, the prophetic people, to have discernment, to have the bullshit detector that when you read, you know what's happening. But you have to start somewhere. I'm just constantly... Okay, I don't want to use the word, but I, I was a bit surprised, maybe a bit annoyed. When I talk to people and I'm talking about kingdom people, they have very little understanding of what's happening out there. That's not acceptable in this season because we really need to know what's affecting the culture, what's causing nations to become good. Because remember, at the end of the day, our goal is to cause nations to be shaped. If we don't understand what caused them to remain in darkness, how can we begin to disciple them? We can't. So this is something that I really want to, to encourage you all. Start somewhere. If you don't know where to start, talk to some of us. We can always give you some recommendation. You, you can start somewhere, okay? So we talk about the concept of culture models. Basically, we look at certain part of society and you look today, you know Wall Street, you know Hollywood, you know certain, certain regimes, certain power, you know big tech, they have great influence over culture. Today, so many young people, they are not in Facebook anymore. They are not even on Twitter. They are on TikTok, for example, because these are the culture molders. And it can shift. It kept shifting. So we have to understand who is controlling the culture. So here's the point for us to remember. If we want to influence culture, that's our goal. Why? Because when you influence culture, you can begin to disciple a nation. You can begin to give them a choice and say, is this what you want? I was just reading an article yesterday, very interesting. It's one of the biggest PR company in the United States. And they sent out a secret email to all the companies under them. They have Coca-Cola, they have Netflix, etc. as their client. And they say, do not respond to breaking news. Do not have a position on abortion. Because if you go woke, you go broke. So you see, the corporate are starting to understand. That's why when the leak of the Supreme Court uh, draft opinion, did you, did you see the reaction? It's, it's pretty muted. It is, it is a bit of outrage, but it's almost like they are trying to say, hey, come on, get angry, get angry. But people are like, whatever, whatever. And this reminds me of, in, in Malaysia, one of the things, the boogeyman that the, the enemy has always tried to stir up is May 13. They always say, if there's a shift of government, there will be riots. I tell you, this generation doesn't believe in that anymore. That's why we have 308. That's why 2018, we, we are able to shift federal government because the new generation doesn't believe in this kind of crap anymore. So that is what's happening when truth goes out there, when culture are being influenced, eventually good and evil, it will become clear. It will become clear for people to choose. That's all we are asking. We can't force people to choose God. But we can at least say, these are the facts. They are not under some kind of mind control and then they have an opportunity to decide, do I want heaven or do I want hell? So when we talk about gospel or kingdom, it is a power and authority obtained by Jesus. Remember when Jesus resurrected, he told his disciples, all authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. Therefore now I commission you as one. 
And, and that's the thing. We have this gospel of kingdom. Ultimately, our goal is we want to establish the kingdom of God on earth so that eventually there will be a great harvest. Now, make no mistake. Everyone still need to make their own decision. We cannot force people. But we need to give them the best possible chance to shift. So, the gospel of kingdom, one way to look at it is a mandate to shift culture. Because the, this gospel and this mandate, the assignment from Jesus, it can cause nations to choose. You see, nations, in the book of Ezekiel, it says nations are in a valley of decision. They can either become sheep or they can become goat. That's why there is this, you know, the, the, the media has been saying every time uh, 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 things happen that cause nations to decide their faith. It's like a wrecking ball kind of anointing. So Donald Trump, for example, represents that kind of wrecking ball because for better or worse, people will start to make a choice. Now, another way to look at it is this. Everything that happens on earth, two things. Either it glorifies God in heaven or it glorifies Satan in hell. Either way, there is no middle ground. I think we are coming to an era where we cannot afford to be in middle ground. That's why when I was young, you know the, the verse in Revelation, right? You know, Jesus say, I hate the lukewarm. And I used to think, lukewarm, not so bad. Uh. You know, there's a bit of goodness there. But now you really see lukewarm, God hates lukewarm. Because you either be hot for evil or you be hot for God. So in the midst of all this struggle, and here's the interesting thing, here's the exciting thing, the Lord is causing a reformation within the Ecclesia. That's you and me, right? God is doing something that will change. There is a restoration of all things. Remember Acts 3. Jesus must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. So that is happening right now. The body of Christ are being shaped into a kingdom motivating, a kingdom demonstrating. Now, some of you are, are, are given the gifts of signs and wonder. And, and this is really the time you, you need to begin to use it. And signs and wonder is not like, oh, we have an evangelist, we have a healing meeting. It, it can be that, but it's just wherever you are, you are able to dispense that anointing. It doesn't have to be a meeting like this. It doesn't have to be like, come on, invite a few thousand people. Yes, there will be that kind of evangelist that will rise up and you will do a stadium meeting and that will be great. But for the rest of us who are not going to that, wherever we are, we can be a conduit for God in signs and wonder. So talking about the time, Passover, we just celebrated. Passover is like the shift. We, we, we keep talking about shifting, right? Crossing over the concept. Then Pentecost is the time we receive the Word and the Spirit. So now is that transition time. Now is that dangerous time. Do you, you realize what happened with Israel? As they traveled to Sinai, they were about to receive Torah. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, I, I need you to begin to cleanse yourself. I need you to prepare. And they're like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. Did, did you realize what happened? That was the beginning of the end for them. Then the tribe rebel, then you have Korah, then you have Miriam, you have Aaron. It's just a whole progression and until God became fed up and said, enough with this generation, you are going into the wilderness. So, so that's not what we want. So ER is a time of great opportunity, but we have to seize the moment and really go beyond in this season. Now let me just talk a little bit about kingdom-minded, kingdom-motivated. I think a few weeks ago, I kind of just talked about this slide, but let's just go through quickly. We, every believer, we need to be kingdom-minded and kingdom-motivated. Now, Apostle Peter Werner, many years ago, he said this, we are now in an era where believers can be differentiated by their kingdom motivation rather than their ability to speak in time. Why speak in time? Because for the longest time, the church is sort of categorized tongue-speaking and non-tongue-speaking. It is it's like, it's something that is important to a large segment of the body of Christ. But today, you can see spirit-filled believers who are not kingdom-minded. It's happening. It's happening. So what is kingdom-minded? It's really, we're being influenced. We're being led by the Spirit of God. And you know, coming from a background of biblical teaching, you know, I came from a very evangelical kind of training. Everything is the Word of God, Word of God, Word of God. You know, we go to Bible camp, one book, five days study one book, you know, that kind of training. And so it's so easy for us to not be led by the Spirit of God. It's so easy. 
those of us claiming come from traditional background, you know what I'm talking about. So we have to constantly be led by the Spirit of God. And I think about in the 80s and 90s, you see the churches start to have a lot of system, right? They start to say, oh, do this. And I'm not against system. I'm not against planning. But at some point, they became hardened. They were not moved by the Spirit of God. And they just became stagnant. So, so many systems. I don't need to name names, but some of the biggest uh, churches system, they were successful to a degree. But we must constantly be reminded that there is, there is a boss out there. There is a superior out there. So, so I like what Jerry is saying. You know, I, I've done my work. I submit to my superior. There is an ultimate superior out there. Kingdom Minded is a biblical mindset. So the way we understand biblical is very different because there is that Hebraic mindset. The Hebraic mindset basically like this. Every month we come to celebrate First Road, there is a prophetic portal. When we step into that, the world became alive. Whereas, you can spend one week studying one chapter. So what? So what if you don't have the Spirit of God? I mean, we, we have gone through that phase, okay? So when we talk about biblical mindset, we're talking about being influenced by the Spirit of God, but then it's opposing the other mindset, the Greek mindset, the Confucius mindset, socialism, whatever. And, and that's why every time, if you feel like the external Mindset is kind of overwhelming you. That means you are not being biblical. You are being pushed to one side. And that's where you will say, I need the Spirit of God to come once again. Kingdom minded, when we see the kingdom of God first, kingdom first. And I think one of the things that really can, you know now, of course, you know what's happening with the political scene in US is there's a movement called the American first. And really, you begin to see there is that, I mean, there is, a, there is that, that attempt here to, call, you know, to make us a Malaysian first, but I'm not sure. It's not really gaining traction yet. But when we talk about the kingdom of God, it's that we are giving the kingdom of God priority and then everything else falls into place. Now what about kingdom motivated? What, what does that mean? It's a similar concept, but it's a detail. So we start to ask question, does kingdom motivate me? That means, in my day-to-day -day activity, in my action, am I thinking about kingdom? Am I thinking about how God can be glorified? Am I thinking about how a place can be affected by the Spirit of God so that people will have an opportunity to step into His kingdom? Then, we, we talk about our planning, our use of time, our use of resources. And, and that's why it's so great to hear the testimony. So many people are like, you know, it's not easy for me to set aside the time to do this, do this, do that. But when I chose, that is what first fruit is all about, right? That we give our best and then everything else, God can do it for us. Kingdom motivated, can I separate my personal opinion? Now, this is very challenging. I'm not going to lie to you because we all have opinion. We all think we are right. Who doesn't think you are right? We all think we are right, right? I mean, with certain things, and we are very sure, and it's okay, that's part of being human, but then at some point, if we prioritize kingdom, we have to allow ourselves to be corrected. We have to allow ourselves to say, okay, I was wrong, and here's the way of kingdom. So the other thing, which I already mentioned early on, true kingdom manifestation, it will take place in the natural and spiritual. So, so many, some people have great spiritual success, but no natural success. Others have great natural success, but no spiritual success. It has to be both. We have to be successful in both. So to sum out, kingdom minded, kingdom motivated, here's what Jesus said, right? Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So the kingdom includes the righteousness. The kingdom includes his law, his standard. And then all these things will be provided. Some translations say, all these things will be added unto you. So that's the thing, that when we give priority to God, He will cause everything to fall in line. Okay, so let's talk about Seven Mountain for a while, and you have seen this, um, you know, the different culture model, and you're going to ask God, where are you? So because we're in the month of Ia, now next week, we have the angelic training, but the week after that, we're going to start to talk about the first mountain. I'm going to talk about media first because Ia is provided, media is provided. So it can be 
a, a good provided or it can be a false provided. So that is what happening in media. So we're going into that first. But then some of the other things, which area are you in? Which place are you assigned to be? And that's the thing that you have to ask God and, and ask the Lord to send you into that place. So when with each mountain, so that's why we're going to we're going to cover every mountain in the next few weeks, all the way before five, seven, eight, two is finished. We're going to ask a few questions. What are the core spiritual and natural gifts required? So, so that's why for you to consider which mountain to go, you have to look at yourself. What are your natural gifts? What are your spiritual gifts? Uh, what are you supposed to do? What is my assignment? Because even people in the same mountain can be very different, right? So, so you talk, talk about education, you know, some people are teachers, some people are development of curriculum, some people are administrators, etc, etc. And then some of you are called to be intercessor. Some people with a strong gift of intercession, their focus is more intercessory. So if that's you, then what am I supposed to pray? Even intercessors in the same mountain don't operate the same. We need micro churches. We need to begin to understand how micro churches are different from regular church. It's not just equipping. It's not just fellowshipping. It's something else, okay? Then, of course, in the mountain, what will give us the significant advantage is when we find the Cyruses. You know, the Cyruses really help the kingdom of God. Who are the Cyrus influencers that the Lord will cause? An alignment with wherever kingdom sphere that we're in. And finally, all the things that we do, are we able to measure our objective and standard of success? So you see, every time you say you want to do something, you have to be able to do it in such a way that you can assess, you can measure. So after a while, you're like, okay, this is successful, this is failure. So let's say you want to do a project, you need to define ways where it is successful or it is fa a failure. Okay, so, so the four things, the four or five things, uh, we're going to talk about this very quickly as an introduction today and then in weeks to come, we start to go into it. So spiritual and natural gift, we are talking about what is the right gift mix, what gift combination you have, what is your exact role and assignment. Now, this is not something you can answer immediately. You have to go into the mountain, you have to try a little bit and maybe you even have to change assignments some of you have to change job. Some of you have to go under different mentoring. Some of you have to try different adventure, and then eventually you find your right role. And then every time we talk about going to the mountain, there is this um, tension. On one hand, we had to develop, right? So we are like we have training. Then you ask them. So, so recently, you, you saw right? We have a espresso machine down there, right? So so we have some barista being trained, but you have not seen any coffee being offered because. It's the balance between training and trying to sell and charge money. <laughs> it's the same, right? Everything we do, you prepare. Are you, are you prepared to go into the market? Because if your product is not good, you'll be rejected. So that's why this is a very important tension. And I want to say this in relation to commissioning. Because commissioning is a very fluid kind of thing. And you know, the, the, the leaders, the authority structure can, can kind of say, we think it's time. You yourself can say, I think it's time. But then there is a whole discussion. There's a whole, you know, talking and, and just coming to a mutual agreement. So it's very important. I think that we, we find the right balance here. Okay, so that's what I already mentioned earlier on. Uh, I, I feel like co commissioning is not something that we should really, really uh, seek for like, like, like prophecy in the past. But rather, the key is, are we discerning our gift? Are we understanding our exact role and assignment? Now, micro church, what is it about? It is a kingdom party, not, not the party party, okay? The, the group of people. But then, micro church is really about the tribe with solution. It's not so much fellowshipping, it's not even equipping. But you think about Daniel and his friends, you think about Paul and his apostolic uh, partners, etc., etc. They, they, they are ruling and reigning with the keys of heaven. They are promoting and pushing kingdom agenda. So that's the, the thing, that we need this kind of support group. Otherwise, we'll be just a lone ranger in whatever mountain that we're called. Then Cyrus, what do we mean by Cyrus? We, we have to see who are the kings of the mountains. 
Now, by the way, Cyrus are not necessarily believer. Cyrus are not necessarily always for the kingdom of God. But for a season, they could help us to build the house of God. We had to ask the question, how might they align with kingdom? Finally, with goals and objectives, what are we talking about? We're talking about measurable goals and re results. Are we able to, to really quantify? Are we able to calculate? And we just ask a very simple question. In all the things that we do, is the kingdom of God manifesting? Is God showing up? If you say you are doing this for kingdom, is God showing up? And that's why I want to think about goal and objective. I, I might as well just say right now is that it has to be an objective measure. That means other people can see, not you yourself. Because when we do something, we always say, hey, it's successful, ma. It's successful, ma. What else do you want? But if everyone else say it's a failure, that, that means objectively you are a failure. So that's why it's very important that we come to a place of humility. So that's what it means by objective. Other people can see. Not you yourself. Not you yourself, check up, okay? Okay, with this, let's go into the four very quickly. Uh, I just want to give a bit more teaching and foundation, then we can apply um, for, for our different mountains. So, spiritual and natural gift, I know we have many teaching on this, but in the month of ER, let's talk about it again because ER is a prophetic, and you know, prophetic is so linked with spiritual gifts. The prophetic activates spiritual gifts. That's why this is the month, if you feel like there is any dormant spiritual gift, this is the time you need to get someone to lay hands on you, to cause it to come out. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Remember 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter on love, right? So that's why a lot of people is like, oh, Paul talk about love. It's like, no need spiritual gift. Hello? The next chapter, verse 1, pursue love, yet. What do you mean by yet? Also, you must pay attention. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So there's no such thing as love override spiritual gifts. That is what the teaching of anti-spiritual gift churches try to do. But the next verse already, but especially that you may prophesy even within spiritual gifts, there is a great emphasis and exhortation on prophecy. Why? Later we'll talk about that. Then verse 12. So also you, towards the end, he sum out, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, of course the church of Corinth are very passionate about spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. So now, Apostle Paul lay down the reason for spiritual gifts. Why do you have that? It's to edify, it's to build up one another. But regardless of how you read the whole chapter, we are all exhorted, we are all encouraged, we are all asked to desire earnestly all spiritual gifts. The purpose, edification of the church. Desire came from the Greek word zilu, right? It means great zeal, great passion. So it's like you are so wanting it. You know, have you ever so want something? I don't know, you know, people can, you know, they want to buy things or they want a particular relationship, they want to go to vacation, whatever, you know, it's all different. It's all different. But there is great zeal, there is great passion, then the other thing about Zilu, you pursue it with all your might and power. Actually, I can think of one person, David, whenever everything he does, he, he pursue it with all his might and all his power, right? He's not a half-hearted person. He is an all-in person. So that's why this is a season, whatever you want to do, go all-in. But make sure you hear from God. Because if you go all-in the wrong way, you know, in Chinese we say, you know, you, 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 you hit into the wall. So, so be very, very careful. But Zilu is used to talk about spiritual gifts. Have such passion and zeal. Now, all spiritual gifts are good, right? All are good. But then Apostle Paul say, you should desire the gift of prophecy more. Hey, we didn't say that, okay? That's what the scripture say, right? Especially... So why is the gift of prophecy? We all have done so many prophetic training, but if you want a one-line summary, this is what, how I'll say it. It's the expression of intercession. It's really standing between heaven and earth. That's why Ia. Ia happened before, right in between leaving of Egypt and then at Sinai. Because standing before. It's a dynamic between. What is the dynamic between? It's the mind and heart of Christ. God wants to communicate to us, but at the same time, we have requests, we have desire. 
Now, I know some people say this is the function of priests, but priests, the prophet, they are all part of the intercessory expression. They are all part of the gift of prophecy. The other thing about prophecy, why it can edify is because this is how Bishop Bill Hammond described it. It's a shotgun. If you know how shotgun operates, shotgun is like, it's pellet, many, many tiny pellet. So if I have a shotgun here, I, I, I open fire, it will hit many people. That's why it's, a, it's, a, it's an explosion of pellet. It will bless many people. That's why one of the words, one of the prophetic principles, you know, when God say, my, my words will not go out without it returning, right? It's like when people hear, when you hear other prophetic words, that's why whenever we give a commissioning a prophetic word, we always want to do it in public so that everyone can hear it. Do you know that if that person doesn't receive it and other people down there hear it, they, they can get it? They can apportion it for themselves. So that, that is how it works. Now, of course, this is a gift. Then there is the office level, which is basically the same thing. It's a higher level anointing. But then we, we are focusing on edification. We are focusing on equipping. Now, that's the same for all the fivefold. The apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor, it's the same. You, when you are in office level, you don't do. You train. You impart. You send people out. And, and very often, you look at the fivefold. They, they, are, they can interchange one. Most of them can prophesy very, very well. But it's just that, that aspect. They are trying to cause the body of Christ to grow. Anyway, here's the important thing. When we talk about seven mountains, prophetic edge is applicable. It's important. So you can't say, I go to seven mountain, I'm going to hire some prophets to help me. No, you have to learn to hear God for yourself. Now, of course, you get intercessors. You get some people who are more prophetic in a particular area. They will help you. But we ourselves must have the basic ability to hear from God. Okay, so let's talk about Okay, we talk about spiritual gift. What about natural gift? Now, this is a verse we always quote, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 9 to 11. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. Usually we stop here, right? But let's look at the full context today. But when perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then, I will know fully just as I have been fully known. Now, this gives us a full context of what it means by we know in part. Now, we can break down this in many, many things, but two things I want to emphasize today. The first thing is, the prophetic gift is progressive. Not the liberal progressive, okay? Progressive as in we continue to grow. I mean, we always have to give some disclaimer. We continue to grow more and more. The more we use... The, more, the, the better we become. So it, we are always going from one level to another. It's not a competition. Some people think everything is a competition. It's not. The, the, the Confucius mindset is all about competition. It's all about number one, number two, number three. No, it's not like that. It's progressive. We become more and more mature. What do we mean by mature? Today, you are more mature than yesterday. It's that simple. Then the other thing, the second point, the prophetic gift does not replace our natural mind. That's why he say. We, we see mirror dimly. We, we know in part. So it's like whatever we receive is only a portion. It's not the B O N O. So that's why the, the prophetic maturity, you don't take one prophecy and hinge everything based on that word. It doesn't work like that. So that's why major decision in life, you, you know, we, we talk about marriage, we talk about certain things. It, it's not permissible to use personal prophecy in those circumstances. So that's why, don't throw away your common sense. Don't throw away your brain. I mean, we say that many, many times already, but that's the scripture. The last part, I already mentioned early on, but I just want to quickly talk about it. There is a great need, there is a great urgency for the people of God. We need to understand the world. And I just find that we are a bit ignorant. We are not quite equipped to understand what's happening. Because for the longest time, the, the teaching is, oh, we just stay in the church, it's okay. Rapture will come. So if you're lucky, you'll be raptured. If you're not lucky, you'll be left behind. That's the teaching, right? That's a very common teaching. So we need to understand. We need to have the knowledge, especially the sphere you are in. Let's say you are called into governmental mountain. You have to understand government. You cannot be like, I, I don't know what's the right word. You cannot be ignorant. You know, when people talk about what's happening with politics, and you're like, what, what's that? What's that? What, what's the MP? You know, that kind of thing. It, it's like, 
Just unbelievable. I mean, if you are going to us and entertainment, you have to know what's happening, right? You cannot be like, just don't know anything. So that's why the increase of natural knowledge, how things work. Why? Because our God is a big God. He is concerned about all things. And sometimes we think, I, I tell you, God is more melancholy than you. He knows the, I, I mean, we, we talk about huge database, right? terabyte and, and things like that. I tell you, God's database is from the beginning to the end and plus some more. He remembers everything. So at any point in time, oops, any point in time, God enters into our time stream and begins to give us a revelation. That's how word of knowledge works. That's how word of wisdom works. That's why he has solution to everything. I mean, he has seen the end. So that's why he is concerned and, and he wants us. So I really feel like this is a time we have to dive in whichever area you are in. So today, whatever mountain you are called to, Make a commitment to begin to learn more. Make a commitment to find the right information. Make a commitment to learn from other people who can guide. Make a commitment to learn from kingdom-minded biblical people because you don't want to learn from the fake news. You don't want to learn from those who are against God. But you want to learn from people that understand what God is trying to do. So we increase our capacity to do what? to learn, to think, to process, to execute. So the last two years with the pandemic, I think this is really the test for us. Are we processing what's happening? Then we can begin to use our God-given spiritual and natural gifts. Both come together. Okay, I want to use this one thing. Now, we are shown this very often in our government microchurch. So this is something that will help us to begin to think, if I'm called into a particular mountain, now this is for governmental mountain, but we'll do the same chart for all the seven mountains. So it's like, let's say you are called into government mountain, there are a few roles, a few possible assignments. Now this is not a guide or anything, this is just to co cause you to think, you know, to, to, to make some consideration. So government mountain, you don't ask, do I have a direct role? So what is a direct role? That means you can be a ruler, you can be a prime minister. Do you know that some people are called to be prime minister? Some people know they're supposed to be prime minister or president. Uh, that would be so cool, right? Lawmakers, member of parliament, state representative, some are administrator. Maybe you can become the chief secretary of Malaysian government. I tell you, that role is probably more powerful than prime minister. Tell you a story and it's like, when they were amending Companies Act 2016, right? And they had to do, you know, there is such a huge act that when they amended, they had to amend many, many other laws. So one of them is a housing, housing development law. And they talk about, you know, the, the house owner always complain, right? The developer is not doing their job, we need penalty and things like that. So they have a meeting to call all the department, all the head of department come. And they want to change a particular clause. And they were arguing for days and weeks and finally, someone said, oh, the chief secretary said, no need to talk about it anymore. Okay, end of meeting. So that was the time I really began to understand the chief secretary of our government is really in terms of the bureaucracy, he's number one. You don't even need to argue. The ministers have to listen to him. So some of you are called there. Don't underestimate this role. Then you could be a supportive. Supportive meaning you're not directly... Of course, in US, you have chief of staff, but actually in Malaysia, they started to have chief of staff. That means you are not the direct ruler, but you are managing his crew. This, this kind of position is very, very, very influential. Someone like Joseph, someone like Daniel, they, they have the ears of the ruler. Senior advisors. In politics, senior advisors are like gold mine, okay? Then, of course, there are some of you go into a cross mountain, maybe you are from business mountain, maybe you are from education mountain, but somehow you get a role in government. Then still, there are some of you, your role is more from the body of Christ. You are more equipper. You could be a 5-4. You are not directly in government, but you are causing people to be trained to go to government. So sometimes we get asked to teach, uh, you know, politician or things like that because they want to know what is the standard of God. So you could be doing that. You could be intercessors. This is huge. Intercessors are important for across all the seven mountains. Then some in the body of Christ, you are connector. You are connecting people from mountain. So in terms of the matrix, most of us, we start in religion mountain, right? We became a believer. We are here. We come to church. And then 
I think all of us here are marketplace. A any full-time minister here? No, right? I mean, full-time, I think your, your full salary comes from it. N nobody here, right? So, so we, we go into marketplace, and then now it's a season. So many of you are hybrid. You are using your gift here, but you're also using your gift out there. And then in days to come, many of you will be cross mountain. That means you'll be in media, you'll be in government. And, and that's the thing. I, I believe that many of you, at least God wants to put you in two or three or four. The cross kind of thing. So this is just a very simple guide for you to, to, to just kind of ask God, come on, Lord, show me. I mean, it's not like you, you take a die and throw it, okay? But it's just like, show me and I believe God will show you. Which area? Are you a direct? Are you a supportive? Or are you called to function more from the ecclesia? The other thing that will help us is we, we start to think about kingdom progression. So these are just tools to help us. Luke 10, of course, is a very interesting passage because that this really showed the difference between Jesus and John the Baptist. Jesus sent two by two, right? That's why the spiritual warfare rule is you never do it alone, at least two. So Jesus sent two by two and, and what are the principles? The first thing is you greet them, you say hello, and then the people, the world, marketplace, they see something in you. Then they receive you. Come in, come to my house, come to my sphere, and then what's the next thing? You wait for them to invite you to their social circle. Because they say, eat what is set before you. That's what Jesus said, right? Why would they give you eat? And then as you interact, all of a sudden, you see an opportunity to bless them, heal them. I mean, so many people today need healing, all kinds of healing. Physical healing, emotional healing, business healing. And, and some of you will be like, okay, I don't know about your business, but you know, I, I, I can just lay hands, I can just pray. And all of a sudden you see, that's why, you know, Elisha, for example, he was a prophet. He, he was almost like an apostle type. He was solving problems all around. He was like, able to break through. So that's the thing. You see an opportunity, you fix it. And then when things are fixed, all of a sudden you have an opportunity, you usher in the kingdom. You begin to declare, the kingdom of God is here. Do you want it? And, and that's how Jesus touched so many people. And that's how his disciples, so many want to come into the kingdom of God. Not inside the four walls. These are all happening outside in a marketplace. So that's the, the whole thing, the natural and spiritual part. Okay, I just have a few more slides to go. Finding your micro church in seven months. Now, just very quickly, in the same verse, in the same chapter, Luke 10, this is what Jesus gave as a warning. Go, behold, I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. So every time we are sent out, every time we are commissioned, What's happening? We're going to face tremendous fight. We're going to face spiritual warfare at the place, not at any place, just the place we are sent and commissioned. That's why I just want to encourage everyone. I want everyone to know that this is a season we're going to do a lot of commissioning and sending. Don't like, like very greedy. I want to be commissioned to everything because every time you are sent, there's a mark on your head. There's a spiritual warfare mark. And I always say that you have to be very selective because we all have a lot of gifts. You cannot be commissioned to all the gifts at the same time. It doesn't work like that. Now, of course, there'll be a lot of discussion. We'll try to guide you. But as a general principle, we have to understand every time we are sent out, there is a fight. So, so God will, will, will let you know which aspect you have to focus on. We already mentioned earlier on that we need to have a solid kingdom biblical foundation. So, what is the purpose of micro church? Micro church really is a place, and, and micro it could be just two or three people. Um, Wilberforce has a micro church. Daniel has a micro church. We look at Abraham. We look at Paul. They all have different kind of micro church. So, we have done teaching on this, but we're, and we're going to in weeks to come. We're going to look at how it is different from mountain to mountain. But the th the thing to remember now is it's not the same as regular ecclesia. It, it is not the place. We get equipping and fellowshipping, but we are like trying to process certain things. We are trying to process kingdom agenda. We are trying to solve problem. So, you know, I was just thinking about how would a religion mountain microchurch look like, you know, because we are somewhat religion mountain, right? 
And I, I think here, we are a bit of hybrid. We know we have a bit of micro church function, but we still have equipping. We still have fellowship, even though that's not our priority. But when people come, they expect some kind of fellowship, right? Because fellowship is good. We're not anti-fellowship. Actually, we all love fellowship very much. That's, that's why we got the coffee machine there. But, <laughs> but that's the thing. We, we, we are not against that, but we're just saying that's not the point. That's not the B-O-N-O -O agenda. Okay, next thing, Cyrus. Now let me just show you the verse on Cyrus and very interesting because Cyrus is so related to the year of building the house of God. 2 Chronicles 36, 23 verse. This is what Cyrus king of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to do what? Build him a house. Are we in the year of building the house of God? That's why, should we not expect Cyrus and which is in Judah, whoever there is among you, of all his people, do you see the invitation? Siapa mau datang, datang. Whoever wants, come. May the Lord, may God, may the Lord his God be with him. Go up then. It's like a free invitation. So Cyrus, here's the thing. He is an ally. He is someone that shall help. You know, whenever we use the expression shall help, that means he could help, but it depends on you. It depends whether you want his help or not. So, so there are Cyruses happening all around the world, but sometimes the body of Christ, we are not recognizing. We sometimes even reject Cyrus. Oh, this is from Persia. Very dangerous, you know, Persia. Persian are, I don't know, whatever you want to call them. So, but he is an ally that can help the ecclesia in the building of the house of God. The other thing about Cyrus, why is he helpful? Because he owns large portions. He say, all the kingdoms of earth belong to me. Right? So we look at the Cyruses, they are really in big businesses, they own a lot of shares and stock. They are really the power brokers, the power players in the different mountain. Now, here's the thing that we have to understand about Cyrus. It is what I call a permissible anointing. That means it allows us to go. It allows us to go beyond. It's that we have certain circumstances, we have certain obstacles, and all of a sudden someone came and helped us to do that. That's Cyrus. So I have to remind you again that Cyrus may not necessarily be part of the kingdom of God, but he could be. He could be. I mean, when you read all the things about Cyrus in the Bible, there is some hint that maybe he knew Jehovah. Maybe eventually he believed. We don't know for sure. But definitely he has an awareness. He understood who the God of Israel is. And he was very willing to help them. So this is what we need to do. We have to find these kind of people and the favour of God will cause us to be aligned. So in any mountain, education mountain, business, arts and entertainment, media, whatever, this is the person to look for. Okay, let's talk about goals and objectives. This is the last part already, okay? And, and this is really for us to kind of process, for us to think. Now, we already said many things, we already give you certain charts to think, but a few questions, this is something for you to think about. What is our ultimate calling? What is my calling? And the whole process, we call that convergence. You try different assignments. You try with different people. After a season, you get to know yourself better and better. So, so Apostle Peter Wagner, he, he talked about convergence. In fact, his last book before he passed away, and he talked about the six principles he learned. One of it is convergence. And basically, we, we try many things at a certain age, normally. Around 40 and 50, people reach the stage of convergence. They reach the stage where they try enough and they are secure enough to say, this doesn't work for me, this works for me. I'm going to pursue the two or three great things. In order to understand this, we have to first identify spiritual and natural gifts. But not just gifts, potential. That means, what are we good with? What you know what a person could be? What is their level? Now, we are all, all not given the same level. So I'll give you an example. A person could be called into government and his or her level is local government. He could be a local counsellor, but that is all God asked him or her to do. And if he or she achieved that, he will have fulfilled his destiny. But some are called to be president, some are called to be prime ministers. The level, the natural level are not the same. So that's why the gifts, the potentials, 
there needs to be there needs to be a discussion with trusted authority structure. You know, people who have authority over our life at a certain age. It will be our parents. It will be our family. At other stage, it could be your natural leader. It could be your boss. It could be your alignment leader, etc., etc. It's oh, don't be too spiritual. Don't be too natural. By the way, your natural boss can also be part of your authority structure that helps you to process your destiny. So I know some Christians are like, oh, I, I, don't want, I don't listen to my boss. It's like, why well, God puts him or her there to make sure you go to the next level? There are people like that. What if that person is a Cyrus in your life? So that's why the above operates both natural and spiritual. So the other thing, of course, is while we are in the process, we are always in the process. Remember, the, the, the prophetic is progressive. We need to start to imagine what is the picture what is the condition if we are successful in obtaining our goals and objectives? What will it look like? So I, I, I think, uh, I, I think the, one of the prophets, Johnny Anglo, he, he wrote a few books on Seven Mountains. Very interesting. And it's really his imagination of what a successful, transformed arena of the Seven Mountains look like. So the prophets can do that. The prophets can dream and, and have a... So, so it's a combination of what he sense, what he feel, and also what he hope. So what we look like for ourselves, that means if we achieve our goal, how will we be different? Are we going to be changed? Are we going to upgrade? How will it look like for other people? There are people who are part of your tribe, part of your team, part of your family. If you go up level, how would they look like? They should look great also, right? They should also be upgraded. What would it look like within our sphere? What is a successful transformation? So we talk about, in government, for example, what will be a successful transformation in Malaysia? I mean, Malaysia has so many governmental things needs to be fixed. One general election is not going to fix it. So, so we start to, so those who are called into that area begin to think, begin to imagine, begin to allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God, the covenant of God to cause them to hope once again. That's why hope is so important. Hope is, hope is really the antidote to hope defer. Right? I mean, in this land, we, we know too well Hope Defer is operating very strongly. A few other things, I'm done already. Goals and objectives. So, one thing to realize is different from mountain to mountain. So, don't look at other people. This is something that I, I find very consistent in a Confucius uh, society is we like to compare, we like to project. Hey, I'm in mean, governmental mountain, you all should do the same. Hey, I'm in media today, you all should do the same. Hey, we're in arts and entertainment now. Everyone should go into arts and entertainment. Don't do that. Don't do that because we all have different calling. We all have different passion. And more importantly, we all have different assignments and one day, we have to give an account to God. You don't want to be, remember, driven by eternity, right? Remember John Bevere did an assignment, right? A pastor was called to be an accountant and he got a shock of his life. So it's different. So it's different from mountain to mountain, but it's also different for everyone, even within the same mountain. Just because you're in the same mountain doesn't mean it's the same. So very, very important. Goals and objectives. We need to learn to define. We need to learn to express. What do I mean by express? That means when there's an opportunity, you're able to share what's your goal, what's your objective. I, I find that some people are really, really good in this, that when they are able to articulate what they're supposed to do, favor comes into their life very quickly. Because all of a sudden people say, hey, that's you and all my life I've been looking for people like you so that I can give my money to you. Did you see how important it is for you to express accurately? And that's why covert, we always teach covert. You know, don't mention God sent me here or things like that. In certain places, that will be the end of the money. Oh, it's God. You know, we are not, we are, we are not for faith kind of thing. You know? So you need to be covert. You need to be wise, okay? So how do you learn to define uh, express? For a start, it can be a, a, a mission statement, a vision statement. Now, of course, some, I, I know at the beginning, if I ask you to do a mission, vision statement, you'll be like, so weird, you know? Mission and vision statement for myself? You know, I want to be a millionaire by the age of 12. I want to be a billionaire by the age of, you know? Not that kind of thing. But it's like when you start to do certain things, when you start to, to carry out certain assignments, when you hear from God, all of a sudden, you are able to do it. You, you can't form mission and vision statement outside the context of an assignment. You can't do that. So many people try to do that. That's why when people are a bit 
too young is very hard. But once they have something to do, and it has nothing to do with age because people can achieve something even at the age of 12, 13. They can do a project. They can have an assignment which are, are, are world-changing even at that age. So the assignment needs to come. This one I already mentioned. That the goals and objectives must be measurable from an objective point of view. That means others can see. They can judge. They can say, you have a grapefruit. Not you yourself say you have a grapefruit. Because so many people say, I have grapefruit. Actually, sometimes we see that, you know, when we're discussing with people about the last few years, we have done a bit more with commissioning and things like that. So people show us, I mean, sometimes we'll be like, mm, is, this, is this all you've done? Yes. It's not, I mean, we didn't say straight to your face, but we're like, it's not enough to be commissioned. So it's okay. You know, if people say that to you, it's okay. That means you just need to go and plant more fruit. You just need to go and plant more trees and harvest more. That's it. No big deal. So, so we need to let others see and judge us. This is one of the process of becoming great. That we are able to put it on the table. We are able to receive feedback. And like, okay, yeah, I acknowledge it was not so good. And now I want to improve. That's how we grow. And then we can fine tune it from time to time. Now, in all this, I know we talk about system, we talk about structure. In all this, never forget this one principle. We must always allow the Spirit of God to guide and override. There are times that God wants to override us because we are like, go a bit crazy already. Or, or, you know, sometimes all the, all the authority structure around us advise us against certain things, but sometimes we don't hear. We all have been there before because we... That is why, you know, the prophetic people, what is our challenge? This is the man of Iyah. Let me tell you what is our challenge. Whenever you say, I hear from God, you know what? You are ending all discussion and conversation. Every time people come and say, I hear from God, I don't argue. Who am I to argue with God? I can't argue with God. So that's why be very, very careful when you use that I hear from God because you are shutting down discussion. You are shutting down feedback. And this is the problem throughout the years, the prophetic people. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong because remember Apostle Paul, when he wanted to go to Jerusalem, oh, he didn't say no. These are the most qualified, the whole elders of Ephesus, the, the four daughters of Philip. These are the highest level of New Testament prophetic team. They all say don't go. But, but it's not about accurate or not accurate. It's about how you process the whole thing. So very, very important that we don't be so hasty in doing that. Okay, in conclusion, let's look at the four things again. And I want to finish today just to give you some questions to think in, in, in which to come. And I really, really want you to begin to ask the law which area, what is the timing. So spiritual and natural gift, let's look at this. Do I know what I have? What gifts I have? Natural or spiritual? What am I supposed to do? So if you're not sure, start to do something and then God will give you more. Micro church group, who are my partners? And I know some of you, if you have not started the first point, if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you're supposed to do, then of course, you won't be able to know who are your partners in terms of kingdom agenda and problem solving. Because remember we say already, the micro church, it, the context has to be within the assignment. You have to have something to do. Only then you can practice. Identify Cyrus. And this is something that God can show you even right now. And some of the people that will help you, but maybe in five years, in 10 years' time, they really become a reality in your life. Who are the power players that the Lord might align me, might align us with? Whatever mountain that you are in. Finally, goals and objectives. Have I set my mission and vision statement in a measurable form? Again, this is not something you can do now until you begin to know what I'm supposed to do. At least do something. So if you're not done anything, just do something. There are so many different opportunities. There are so many teams here. They are always looking, right? We have so many things. Go, go and talk to, to Joyce or myself. You know, so many things that you can do. I mean, the tech team is forever lacking people. The food team also want people. <laughs> Judah, we can always have more. Right? If, if I tell you, you want to do something, there will be something for you to do as part of your training.
So Lord, right now I pray, even as we are being trained in here, Lord, you begin to cause us to have an understanding. What is my sphere? What is my mountain? What is my assignment? And how are you going to send me in this season? So I pray and I declare right now, the Lord will give you revelation in this month of Iyah. The prophetic processing to know what you're supposed to do in this time and moment. Amen.